All right, so uh, Tom kind of kind of like uh, told a slight fib. Some of this is technical, but it's more technical in more of a cerebral sense. Um, if you guys want to get a full technical talk, I can do some showing off later. But this is actually more of a focus around like kind of like how our climate is today and the cyber Hollywood that we're dealing with and everything like that. And I think we're all feeling that. Anybody who's been a security practitioner for how long, at least 15, 10, 15 years, is feeling this Hollywood buzz. Uh, <clears throat> black hat, <clears throat> terrible movie. Um, so uh, I just thought I'd give kind of a realistic perspective for someone who's actually in the trenches with a team that works on cyber counterintelligence, uh, both on the federal side as well as the commercial space. Um, and it's, it's not as on topic as you think uh, for this thing, but trust me, we do a lot of web appsec stuff involved in the work we do, so it's been fun. So um, about me, I'm uh, Lance James, head of cyber intelligence at Deloitte & Touche. The irony is thick, I love it. Welcome KPMG. Um, <laughs> so, well, I mean, thank you. I mean, you're welcome. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right, right. Oh, the big, the big four. Uh, so uh, I've written a few books along the way. Uh, one of the primary ones that people know me for back in the day in the old days is fishing. Um, uh, I've uh, hold advisory board members. I get to be special, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, some of the th real preliminary days of my work was founding a company called Secure Science, which focused on uh, threat intelligence before we called it threat intelligence, uh, which was, we didn't know what we were doing. We were just hacking the hackers. So that's kind of what we did. So we're like, all right. Um, you know, so basically though, just a little bit about me that's more important is I get to run an amazing team at work, right? And I've changed the way Deloitte looks at running an amazing team at work um, in, uh, by basically the team just being the team. You hire them for them being themselves, right? And I just want to say some of my team members out there back there, and I just wanted to say hats, hat tip to you guys as well, because they've really pretty much made us have probably one of the best jobs in the world so over, over, you know, over where we work. So, and I know a lot of people are like Lance James at Deloitte. How does that even work, right? You know, this actually, uh, it's actually the team is the key, man. So, all right, so let's go back into the climate. So everybody knows about the uh, different hacks that have been going on, how many breaches and whatever has gone in last, this last week. All we do is get open the newspaper, we find yet another breach. Um, you know, after a while we get some apathy, and won't care, and it'll just be like, you know, what uh, size of the breaches and how much is the insurance collecting, right? So um, the question is, though, you know, does anybody, can anybody imagine the internet in 2030? Raise your hand if you can imagine it. Right. I mean, I, I've actually come to the, think, the conclusion that we're going to be like President Obama or, or even the next president's going to be like, all right, we've decided to turn it off. <laughs> Guys, we're going back to tin cans and some, uh, some string. OK, uh, we thought we knew how to innovate. We got, you know, we got this all wrong. So um, but as you see, though, in the world of like what you hear, these buzzwords that are going on, uh, this, you know, and this talk is really a buzzword beatdown. Um, you know, the game has never really changed, right, in the sense of, you know, we're all connected now, right? We, everybody's doing some, some of the coolest things on the Internet. Uh, it's, it's one of the best inventions and at the same time probably one of the worst inventions, right? So, um, you know, but the, the game of intelligence today, and I, I really want to talk to companies that are invested in this. Um, you know, uh, back in the old days of spying, you know, dossiers, you know, basically, you know, human work where you'd like get to know people and, and keep an, uh, t uh, tabs on people during the Cold War or whatever. The dossiers of today or, your data, uh, or yesterday or your databases today, everything on your information is online, you know. Um, and we live in a different kind of world today. Some people call it asymmetric warfare. Um, some of the, 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 I'd say the specialized experts on warfare call it fourth generation warfare. You know, we have terrorism, we have insurgencies, right? Some, some people are like talking about anonymous and lulsec, but they don't realize those are insurgencies. Do we have a cyber counterinsurgency uh, framework out there? Does anybody know how to do that? Right, so those are the, these are the different things we're dealing with, right? So um, everything's decentralized. I mean, uh, you know, some of the groups are opportunistic. Um, you know, um, basically psyops, psychological and guerrilla tactics. We talk about certain breaches that, uh, you know, uh, supposedly were in North Korea at the time. No matter who it was, the psyops and the controlling of the media was brilliant. It was completely brilliant. You basically fed them everything they needed, and you saw how that turned out, right? That, that alone was the best psyops game we've seen yet to date on, on any kind of cyber warfare or, you know, or vandalism at this time, right? So, um, you know, but the goals are different. Survival and influence, you know. Uh, we have systems like, uh, like here in America, we are duty-bound. Our, our Judeo-Christian society you know, is, is primarily duty-bound. That's how we are culturally. Right. We have a duty to you know, do this, our patriotic duty. We have like a setup and we have a belief system that works for us. 
But then we also have our enemies that are belief bound. And that belief is an axiom belief, which means you cannot sway it. You know, you can't convince it otherwise. Now, it doesn't make it wrong or right. It's just what it is. It's a different culture. Now, you take the internet and, you know, you, it's not like you're on your easy chair, like basically watching the Iran-Contra affair over with Dan Rather on the news. If there's an Iran-Contra affair now, it affects America because everything is connected, right? It affects everything and all, all of the world, right? So um, the cost of warfare has changed. The cost of war, uh, doing business has changed, right? And people are stepping into the arena, getting on the internet, and then there's also people that are stepping into selling this, you know, intelligence. Um, that I want to talk to you a little bit about that. So, but I'm going to go into the adversary types first, right? So, you know, obviously we hear everything. Like, I mean, nowadays you don't even have to be from the information security community to know what a nation state actor is or, or the different types of actors you have. Or even, like, you know, almost anybody can talk cyber now, right? So, um, we have, but let's, let's talk about that. So we have nation state, supposed nation state. And we have uh, interesting drivers such as economic, political, war, belief, revenge, right? Money, too. No, not all nation states, uh, you know, there's some of them that have to, you know, like, I mean, you know, as I say economic, it doesn't mean that it also isn't getting recon. It isn't warfare. It isn't political. But it's also, for instance, you're seeing a mix of, like, all the news you hear today about Russia, you know, hacking all these banks and this and that. And then someone's saying it's a nation state. Well, it's like... The problem is in the media, no one's really defined and understood what nation state is. The only people who really actually have that defined is the JP 102 in the actual like, the DOD manuals, right? So um, it was kind of a funny thing we had in a conversation today with our team of talking about defining threat intelligence. And it was actually kind of got laughable because you've got one side of the house, you know, citing uh, DOD uh, joint pub documents and the other side, um, you know, saying, well, it's a bunch of buzzwords. It means nothing. And then you know, me in the middle going, well, what exactly do we do here, right? And let's define that, right? Um, you know, and so it's, it's an interesting thing because, you know, have, you know, all these, the same goes for these adversaries. We've, we're starting to categorize adversaries, right? But there's a lot of assumptions, speculation across this, uh, you know. I, I look at a lot of documents that come out that say it's APT XYZ or whatever, but I would not take that with, a, you know, into a court of law with me and, and have it branded as like something I would consider factual. Right, so it's a lot of conjecture, a lot of uh, speculation. And the, what, what today's intelligence is doing is just regurgitating that speculation and adding their speculation on top of it. So it just seems like it's more like opinion intelligence, you know, based in opinion based intelligence. So now we have our corporate intellectual property theft. The interesting thing about intellectual property theft in most cases is in America, we have regulations that really help us kind of behave ourselves. It isn't worth the risk. So you very rarely hear about like company to company intellectual property theft. You don't hear Yahoo wanting to st steal Google's uh, secrets or vice versa, right? So you hear, um, you know, mostly about insider threats, right? Um, but, you know, like obviously we've seen with some breaches that leak out uh, a lot of information. Um, mostly it seems like there's a disgruntledness or an insider threat or, or maybe there is some involvement. And there maybe is a mix. Maybe there's a mix with nation state. Maybe someone's recruited, you know? Uh, we don't know exactly all of Snowden's reasons, but maybe there is, you know, possibility that it was more than just ego or ideology. Might have been some money behind it too as well. So. Um, you know, so, but in the, in, the, in the common sense, as much as we say it is actually common, in some senses, the biggest blocker is ROI, risk of incarceration, right? So, you know, um, usually for a company to be, be behind the idea of stealing from another company, it doesn't usually happen in the U.S. I mean, we do see, obviously, intellectual property theft from foreign companies over in stealing our information, but there's no real consequence there anyways, except for, look what we did. We exposed it, and someone makes a billion dollars because they wrote a report about it. So, oh, I didn't say that loudly, did I? Um, <laughs> you know, so insurgencies, right? One of the things that a lot of people, I don't know if a lot of people figured out really quickly is anonymous when they came onto the scene was an insurgency. That's what it is. It's uh, non-state sponsored. It's pro-state or rebel, but it's basically, you know, has this, uh, you know, it's a basically cyber paramilitary faction. We've seen this with electronic armies, such as the Syrian electronic army, the Tunisian electronic army, uh, obviously LULSEC, uh, some of the, the squads today that are doing stuff. Um, in some senses, some of them are just teenagers, and some of them are political insurgencies, right? Especially in the Middle East. We saw a big history of that last year, especially, you know, uh, down to the point that these successfully dropped the stock on NASDAQ, about 10 points over some of their activity they did. And all of it was psychological operations. Basically, it's no different than like sending pamphlets from helicopters down and saying, do this or this. It's basically ways to affect our belief systems or affect our psychological state or affect our economy by basically, you know, changing or something or scaring us, right? So in this wild, wild web, 
Um, my issue is I go back to that question of 2030. <laughs> Increasingly hostile internet. Yeah, we haven't finished, uh, fixed the problems and I guarantee everybody in here can tell you how many cross-site scripting uh, attacks have you found this week or vulnerabilities in an application? Raise your hand if you found one. Right, come on, all right, all right. Two, three, something like that. All right, raise your hand if you found any SQL injections this week. All right, you can admit it, it's fine. You know, I, you know, NDA aside here, I'm not telling you it. But uh, <laughs> so basically, we still have the same exact problems we did 10, 15 years ago. We're still screaming at the same problem, saying, and, and OWASP being a big champion of this, we lay out the, 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 the bylaws and the laws of science of how to secure what your web application, and I know Joe's next talk will probably be like exactly what this is about, why are we still here, why are we doing the same things. But basically, now imagine, though, a wider, more used internet with the same problems it had 20 years ago, right? That's really kind of where we're going. You know, and now we have uh, you know, international conflicts, you know, um, you know, we have uh, terrorism, obviously, like we said earlier, you know. Um, and then we have actually even like these teenager capabilities, all the tools that a bad guy can use, like that we thought were more sophisticated, available, distributed denial of services on a web, you know, page. You can just do, it's called a booter service. You can just basically pay five bucks and knock down a website for the next like few days. Um, swatting, people getting 911 calls. This is kinetic, right? Phishing malware, tur you know, uh, turf wars, espionage, none of it's gone away, right? Um, you know, global unrest is really going to like, it's going to sit down to, it's also going to mean the internet's a little bit unrestful, right? So the question is, is that, did we ever solve these problems? Phishing? We get less phishing, but you know, it just has evolved into something more efficient called spear phishing. And ironically, I was looking at a talk, uh, that I, uh, that I wrote, uh, years ago about phishing and, and this whole thing about phishing and saying, oh, well, you know, and we didn't call it spear phishing yet, but we, we were talking about how impractical that was. And I'm like, wow, that's a foot and mouth now, isn't it? Because it's the most practical attack to get into a system, right? Um, malware, basically, it's all it is is coupled with the phishing, right? The uh, espionage is just the motive on there, but basically, all the stuff, the DDoSing, the, especially the DDoSing, that hasn't been solved. And the same tools pretty much are doing the same thing they did in the 90s. You know, we had uh, a bunch of DDoS tools in the 90s, email bomb tools, everything like that. Nothing's changed. We have no defense. And now the difference is, is that enterprises are conducting millions of dollars to billions of dollars per day in business online. And if they're shut down for an hour, it could be a critical situation, right? So, and then we add in resilience, right? Tor, I2P, Bitcoin, virtual private network proxies, complete botnets designed to hide your activity. You know, when we have things like that have uh, examples with that that are having impacts, Silk Road, CryptoLocker was a big one, right? Um, Tor Locker. Uh, now we have like things like Dire or Crypto Wall, like the secession to CryptoLocker, basically. And they're all going into anonymous internets. So funny because in 06, I was in meetings uh, on panels about why bad guys aren't using Tor or I2P. And, uh, you know, and, the, and the, the funniest thing is that a lot of times they're still at the uh, least of path resistance. You don't really have to use Tor. But, you know, when it comes down to the ransomware market, it seems to be uh, ideal, you know. So, um, this, so they're only going to be like basically going with uh, the, uh, the, uh, the trends that we're going for. The more we start doing threat intelligence, the more we do security research and it's become popular, what happens now is basically, you know, they're going to adapt to that and focus on resiliency, right? Uh, I just saw in the, the press the other day, someone said that, you know, a deep web search tool is about to become out and that's, that, that'll change everything. And so, and then of course something else will happen, you know, so, you know. Um, now, the ironic part is fixing the 90s stuff, the things that we've all been waiting for people to fix. Um, back in the day when we could just kind of put our legs up after the firewall was configured and, and everything was good. Um, you know, the Sun Tzu's Art of War <laughs> book, if anybody's read it, will pretty much talk about staying in a castle to defend yourself. It's probably the, the, the stupidest move you can do, right? So I, I draw this picture up here. Uh, well, I didn't draw it, obviously. Uh, <laughs> but I put this picture up here for a reason. Now, if you look at it from a, okay, you know, if you look at it from a straight-on perspective, that looks like probably a pretty secure castle, pretty robust, everything like that. But you look at it from here, and that, that cruise missile, does, that's the cruise missile looking at it, right? So that's exactly what, the, <laughs> what, it, what all it takes around here is, you know, everything is now kind of at a bird's eye view on the internet, right? So, you know, and all these, all these uh, companies out there are sitting uh, kind of like going, all right, I got to protect my area, my moat, but it's like pretty much everything is a bird's eye view now. So it's kind of like just rocks at windows, rocks at windows every day, right? Um, and the solutions out there are shiny boxes with blinking lights. Now, what bothers me about that is since 2010, we've come up with these solutions about recognizing botnets in your, your, your environment, right? and APTs in your environment and all this stuff. And the only solutions that I've seen is that they buy something, you know, a CISO comes along, buys something for a million dollars, you know, it promises to do it, 
right? And then it doesn't do it. They are still breached. There's still something going on. But no one's really held the, count, the, the people accountable for doing that. No one actually, and everybody still does business with the same business. And when people, you see all these breaches, well, what did they have and why did it happen? And why didn't your technology? Now, if, if, if uh, certain companies are on the job for the IR, they're going to make sure that they're PRing that. But at the same time, what happens when they you know, go with that solution and find out, hey, you know what, that breached too. Right? So basically, we have this uh, you know, uh, advanced marketing uh, system out there, not any advanced security technologies. Right? Um, the question is also, why is it costing a million dollars when it costs your bad guy $300 to get into your network? Right? So we should be asking ourselves a little bit of a different question. You know? um, another thing, everybody's investing in SOCs, security operations centers, SIM, you know, big thing. Spend a million dollars on something that, you know, another million dollars. There you go. So, um, one problem with it is, is this, when you, uh, install a VoIP line into your new, your new company, who do you call? Do you call, you know, just anybody? No, you call like someone who specializes in data, like phone lines and VoIP and all this stuff. But when you want to secure it, you hand it back to the SOC that looks at everything all the time and may not know anything about security and VoIP or anything like that. So this is the biggest problem is we, we invest in these huge SOC teams, right? And then we basically sit and uh, you know, ask them to look at everything. And if anybody knows anything about doing homework or going to class back in the day, well, it was about 10 or 15% we could take in. And so you had to be kind of aware, a teacher had to be aware of how much a student can take in in a day. Otherwise, you have what's called cognitive overload, right? Now, you're asking uh, you know, um, a SOC to you know, make sure we don't get breached. Now, most of these kids are out of college, making maybe 50,000 a year. Right? And they're looking at, you know, some, they've been basic with the run book and everything like this. And they're looking at everything, right? And you're spending a lot of money on a full room of a bunch of people that if you go any farther than what their knowledge base is, they're going to get confused, right? Yeah, rather spending a little bit more money on the experts in this area and dividing it just like a company's like departments are. If you're, you're protecting a VoIP network, you have some stuff that monitors the VoIP network. You have people that understand the VoIP network. If you're protecting, you know, uh, HR, that you have people that understand the policy, the regulations they're following. You have the people to know what it looks like. But what happens is then they all get a guilt complex because someone got breached, and now everybody's blaming everybody else, and everybody's suffering from corporate PTSD because they think they're going to get fired, right? And then, then basically it makes everything worse, right? So the total cost of ownership in a SOC is not lowered unless it's done right. Now, I will recommend that MITRE wrote a very good, and it's online for free, a very good... Uh, you know, manual on how building a SOC. But the issue is that it's not a technology thing, it's a people thing. It's, it's a how you control the morale, you know, it's, it's how you actually train them. It's also how you actually look at the problems, right? You don't need 50 people looking at everything. You need basically divisions of people looking at a certain things. And the rest of it, you need to basically already know how to handle. Like, you know, obviously sims have use cases and, you, you know, you start building that. But you also build out a QA or development environment for those things, right? But everybody's just reacting right now, obviously, and even SIM is technically a reaction, right? Threat feeds, don't get me started. Everybody thinks that's what threat intelligence is, right? But threat feeds is simply information, and information without uh, a certain process in this the intelligence process is not intelligence, right? Uh, many, many organizations have to be honest and just not be, you know, admit they're not ready for threat intelligence. Another thing that came up today, actually, from the team was, what, do you, what, do you, what is your need for threat intelligence? Why, what exactly are you looking for to service this? And you know, do you know the, 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 um, the cost of this, ad, you know, the adversary against you that's actually like going? Do you know the cost of this and why you're spending a lot of money without understanding the cost of the actual uh, the problem itself? Not spending a million dollars on threat intelligence every year, but you don't know if that's going to actually be the cost to save you. So you haven't really done the economics here, right? So ironically, no one's gotten any intelligence on getting threat intelligence, right? So. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to go kind of a little bit deeper here. So in the way we run our um, intelligence and stuff. So one time I had a, an interesting uh, a use case. I had a guy who's ex uh, farm, you know, very stoic. You know, um, he you know he reads he does the uh, what we call OSINT level one, right? Uh, reads the news basically, and you know, kind of like you know how they do at the DoD, and there's like a briefing of this happened this today, da, 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 right? So. So he's got this. He he uh, briefs this, and he, you know he does more analysis on it, right? So he. Uh, he basically tells me the Syrian Electronic Army hacked Justin Bieber's account today, right? And I'm like, my first question, and this actually surprised everything and got a laugh in the room. I said, what was Justin Bieber doing? Now, everybody's like, you know, what are you a fan? I said, but most people always act like, who's the actor, right? What, what do we know about the actor? But they never understand that the first attack is never a first attack. It's not initiated, it's provoked, right? 
So what we do and control of our perception, who we are, what we are, we're doing, we're the reason we're attacked, right? We may be involved in certain risks, certain businesses. Um, you know, we may have certain influence. In this case, Justin Bieber happened to be, after he did some, uh, some stuff, he happened to be in uh, Dubai at the time, and he ticked off some people in these concerts and got attacked on stage. And these things played a part in understanding. And after that, the, the analyst came to me and goes, now I understand what they're reading, what media they're looking at. Uh, you know, I'm ready for, I could actually start a disinformation campaign. And I said, if you hadn't looked at it that way, you wouldn't come up with the, the who, what, where, and why, all the things that you need to know. Everybody's always ready to label a nation state, you know, set of TTPs that everybody else already knows that, but they don't actually want to take the time and look at what's going on, right? So, you know, what is your first question is usually it's like, who did it and why? Um, you know, everybody goes after what tools, tactics, procedures, TTP, what is the impact? But what about the, the, this question, you know, uh, like for instance, when people do forensics, they're always now looking in IR, they're looking for the bad stuff. I'm like, well, just tell me the story of the hard drive. Let's start there, right? Because you have cognitive bias the minute you're looking for something bad, right? You, you, you're training yourself on what you think looks bad. Well, how do you know what looks bad until you tell me exactly what happened today, right? So, um, so what is the target's timeline? You know, what do we understand, you know, what Justin Bieber was doing that week, right? Do I understand what provoked the situation? What politically might have arised here? And then from the, the, you know, to protect him, next time he might know what, you know, what, might, what he needs to do next time not to provoke the bear. Now, this is using him as an example, but the point is it's the same with perception management of your own companies, your organizations, right? You know, um, so we see that obviously with like uh, threat intelligence providers out there, they're starting to provoke bears. Right? You know, hey, look at this report and look at who we identified here. And they don't have any consideration for the possible escalations that could go on between political countries. Because right? they don't have any of that. They, they've made a cognitive bias assumption that that's an enemy and we're going to take care of it. Right? Um, but basically what we do learn when we ask the right questions and we step back and we you know, are a little bit more of a self-aware or sit in someone else's shoes a little bit in empathy a little bit, we learn the media, the motives, the maneuvers, and we learn what they might do next or how to predict their movements. Right? So, so in the world of um, security, right, information security, right, there's this been hype on cyber intelligence, right? And I joked today, because we were deciding what cyber intelligence was, and we were like, buzzword, meaningless word, and I said, guess what my title is, head of meaningless word, right? So, uh, you know, but the thing is, is there is definitions for this. this there is um, ways to look at this, but what people don't realize is the government version of intelligence is very different than the commercial version. The agendas are different. We talk about this new, everybody's heard about this new threat center, this cyber intelligence center, this new agency that's getting push, pushed out uh, that uh, has been proposed. Um, and uh, one of the discussions about that is, it's like, you know, right now commerce doesn't realize intelligence has been around forever. The government has defined it. Our government's job and agenda is to defend our country. That is their agenda. That, that is their primary objective when it comes to do why they are enacted in, in, in any kind of intelligence tradecraft is to protect us. Why are companies involved in threat intelligence, right? What are exactly, you know, if you take it from a physical perspective, if a company decided to build a tank and said, we're on our own, we're gonna actually start defending these like companies with a big tank, but it wasn't US certified, and it's not federal and everything like this, and it's not like, you know, mandated by the, you know, obviously warfare acts and all the DOD and everything that we do, do you think we'd be able to get away with it? Right? Do, do, do you think we'd be able to just come on and say, I'm going to be a cyber intelligence firm, we're going to go ahead and we're just going to do this. We're going to build a tank or a battleship or whatever, right? So the question is, is right now, the, the posture is right now, the government's kind of laid back and saying, companies, you've got to figure this out and like, you know, you can, you know, do it. Now, we also like that freedom. We, you know, companies love that freedom. We're getting a chance to, to figure stuff out for ourselves. And the government comes in and helps. You know, we obviously have investigations and breaches and things that are going on. So, so there's no dissent on either side, but it is a funny portray when you think about the simplistic, you know, if this was physical security, would we be able to be doing the same thing? Would we have the same rights, right? Um, you know, so I want to talk about more about like counterintelligence. What intelligence, what we are doing today is really what is counterintelligence, not just intelligence. Now, you know, we can go into the intelligence life cycle collection process analysis, you know, all the feedback and planning and the dissemination and the, the, all this, uh, you know, stuff. But that's like one piece. But the reality of what we're all trying to do as organizations and defending yourself is counterintelligence. We're trying to figure out what the adversary is doing and stop them, right? So in espionage countermeasure, it's counterintelligence. In insurgency countermeasures, it's counterinsurgency. And notice that we don't have a cyber counterinsurgency framework or anything. In terrorism, we have counter, is countermeasure of, is, of terrorism. So, 
you know, basically in this world, you know, some of the concerns we have, I mean, whether it's banking Trojans, whether it's this, that, it's a form of exfiltration and spying. They're using spy tools. We are basically going to treat it like counterintelligence, right? So counterintelligence in the, the long run, physical and otherwise, serves a subset of security, right? It's kind of like when you walk into uh, a federal building and they have the, the, uh, the uh, metal detectors, right? Do you expect them not to also have cameras? Right, so, so this is kind of where that kind of plays is, is that you have your physical control, your security set, but then you also have, you know, basically a continued monitoring and understanding. Uh, you know, maybe in some places, if you're in a federal building, they will slide your card, like when you go to the Pentagon, and they'll do a background check, right? So they'll, they'll pull up your file. So when you go to the Pentagon, they're making sure that you're not in the Pentagon for no good reason or, or for, a, for a threat in some sort. So the, this is what's empowering to, to physical security or security in general, right? Um, one without the other these days, as you can see, does not work. We've set up firewalls, we've set up you know, antivirus, we've done all this stuff, but without some kind of you know, form of like intelligence or counterintelligence, you, obviously you know, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of moot, right? So what counterintelligence does is it introduces a tool set empowering agile strategy, right? So people talk about offensive, right? And I'm, I'm not supposed to use that word officially, right? But offensive means proactive. So it's like when you think football. Right? Everybody thinks offensive is like hacking back and you're doing something illegal and you're, you know, and I've always said, why, why would you like, you know, how can you fight a war with a target you can't see or know where they are? You don't have really an aim, so that hacking back doesn't necessarily make sense the way it's been portrayed. But offensive is counterintelligence. It is proactive, right? It means it's, it's your defense team or it's your offense team being defensive or it's your defense team being offensive, right? In this case, it's most likely like the de defense, it's like the Seattle Seahawks. No, um, but basically it's the defense team, you know, being offensive, not letting the ball get through, stopping the, the target. Now it's a proactive thing. Now, if, if you wanted to look at typical defense, it means they just stand there and wait for you to cross through, but they're being proactive. They're moving right on the target, following people who have the ball, go. That is a proactive stance. It's what's considered offensive in counterintelligence, right? It's a practice of uh, a combination of perception and deception management. So in warfare, a concept of perception management, also known as marketing or strategic communications, right? So is basically how do you look, uh, do, you, do you control how you are perceived to everybody else, right? Are you self-aware? And people talk about their networks and are they self-aware, are they self Do you know, uh, you know everything that is coming up? If you're in a negotiations business, do you know yourself enough to know what you're doing and how you're being perceived? You know, did you know or know that you may have like just insulted the guy, right, or not, right? So the same thing goes with perception and deception management. Now the deception side is some of the work we do. Um, kind of like also is controlling, like uh, it's all part of a perception management, uh, you know, uh, gauntlet here. But basically the deception management part is sometimes we have to, you know, uh, basically, you know, honey nets is a good example, right? They think they're in your network, but you want to basically deceive them and you want to understand them. And so you're basically setting them off into a, a, a flurry of little rabbit holes that, you know, protects you, but it's a form of deception, right? Um, it also involves behavior analysis, psychology, information security, obviously. And one of the best things I've ever seen is watching information security, pure information security hacker types, right? The, the ones that, you know, are pro uh, privacy and like screw the government. Watch them when they get together and work with together with like a, a, an intelligence community. It's like a marriage made in heaven. It's literally like hacker. And then you got like someone who understands intelligence, uh, you know, and stuff. And it's, it's literally like, oh, why didn't we meet each other before, right? It's, it's, it's an interesting thing. And it opens eyes on both sides. So, it, you know, uh, it's actually an interesting thing. So it, uh, it also invest investigations. In, uh, and there's also a lot of human intelligence more than anything. Everybody thinks we can automate threat intelligence. You're always going to have the human. And actually, it's probably going to be the most valued asset in the entire bunch of that. So um, it requires in counterintelligence to build it. So similar to the days of threat modeling, which today I feel like no one even understands what a threat model is in the real sense. Um, it requires you to have self and situational awareness, right? Um, it, it's, you know, CI and building out like, you know, a CI program complements threat modeling. Information, secrets, and actors. Those are what I need. I need to know what about my information, my secrets, and my actors. That's your threat model, right? And you go farther than that, it also complements that. It shows us how do we to, get, to pro proactively defend that threat model, right? You know, by like knowing what we're, what's out there, right? Um, a lot of, like I said earlier, your attacks, they're provoked, so they're reactive and sometimes controllable, right? So you can actually learn to control. Once you learn about yourself, you know, you can actually kind of like control a lot more of your enemy's actions before you know it. So, um, so today's advanced persistent threat, we finally get to the buzzword. Uh, I call that uh, technique hacking in the 90s. I mean, that's what we used to call it. We just called it hacking. 
right? Today's APT is, we call sophisticated. And it's like, well, no, no, it's just hacking. Like if you're looking at a box, you want to get in, you're, you're going like, to be behind the wheel and you're going to hack, right? Um, you know, spear phishing, we just called social engineering back then, right? You know, it's like it, it's, it's, the tools are the same, the techniques are the same, right? Um, you know, cybercrime, though, has been opportunistic. You know, grab all, get out, right? Cyber espionage, depending on country, is strategic in nature, right? So it's going to be a little bit more low and slow sometimes, you know, that persistent. Now, we have seen a bridge between some of the eastern cybercrime and the actual, like, success of breaches from APTs and the length to get in there. So we've seen, obviously, if you look at, like, for instance, POS malware against retail banks, that's an APT-type approach, basically adapted by cyber criminals, right? You are now going into the, the, to the actual network and getting into that, building persistence and getting exfiltration in a very wide, very intelligent way, right? So it forced, basically, you know, it's going to force chip and pin here, right? So... Um, you know, I tend to like prefer the name if you're going to give it anything more of an organized persistent threat. That's what it is. You know, it's not always advanced. It depends. Sometimes you have what's called a D team or it's like a runbook team. You know, some of these APTs are literally just runbooks. You know, you, you push them out, you get them out of the way, but they're just running runbooks. They're running tools, right? Like APT, uh, APT1, mostly Windows tools, guys, and all vulnerable. So, um, you know, so it's like, and all they do is they run runbook. And if you confuse them, they get out and then they get back in and then they keep running that run book, right? That's, that's all they do. Um, you know, the difference is maybe the actors behind them, the people behind them, they, they've planned for something else like persistence. You know, you'll see them moving laterally through the network, but didn't all hackers in the 90s also move laterally through the network? Um, you know, malware is typically just used for entry, basically, uh, or like password dumping or, you know, those types. But those are technically come down to just, you know, tool sets. Um, human driven, manually operated. Um, motive is the big differentiator, but I think we're getting muddled even with the media of what like an APT is today. Uh, unfortunately, APT is also good for business, and so using that word, uh, you know, br builds media and it builds up media and bridges media. So the ironic part here is here's the common factor here. If you take a look at botnets and cyber criminals, you, you see the the, the um, different uh, levels of things. For instance, botnets in the broad sense, DDoS, spam, identity theft, credit cards. And you see like certain, I named some of the names the, of the botnets here, Mariposa, whatever, Zeus, credit cards, financial theft. As we get into that though, the line is kind of getting blurry, right? So basically, Zeus has been also used for APT type of, of uh, maneuvers before. And a lot of the technologies found in some of the APT malware is no different than actually like what's in the actual like uh, financial based malware or, or botnet type stuff. So, and then you get like obviously insider threats a lot more highly targeted and, and very specific, right? Um, but you see that that bridge is like, you know, coming to a close, right? Um, so, you know, um, I'm not gonna waste too much time on this. I can actually see how long have I, how much you got? I'm good, okay. So uh, before we go back, you know, one of the things that uh, everybody's been asking, we talk about intelligence, right? Um, what the, does anybody actually have a definition in this room of cyber intelligence? All right, do they have an idea of what that is today? Because, I mean, I keep hearing it in the news, and I'm wondering. So, no? All right. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, what it really comes down to is it's, it's a process, something that's been actually designed for years, right? Um, and very little times do we see actually people working on this process or understanding this process. Now, I've also met that, you know, I, I can talk to a guy who works, you know, has worked at the NSA for years and building out, in, you know, cyber intelligence initiatives and, uh, you know, they have CNEs and CNDs and all these operations and stuff like that. And as, as knowledgeable as he is, there, there's, there's an adjustment that happens to you when you're on the commerce side. You know, you're, you're probably not going to, you know, be able to uh, go overseas and, and extract people and, and, and risk getting killed as much as, as, you know, that. But that said, intelligence again, to the, the, the industry out there is not a game. It is something that's been, it's one of the oldest professions, and it has been mastered, I think, pretty well from, through some of the frameworks on, uh, by our government because it's been kind of their business for a long time. So basically how we do this, though, is, you know, on the first part to establish it, if you actually are looking into building out a threat intelligence environment, we have to start with requirements, also known as planning and direction, right? You can't really require, you know, do anything without, like, some kind of requirements, right? Um, so you basically... Um, Plan based on knowledge of risk and attack vectors, right? But you can get to this point right here, and if you're smart enough and you realize something, you might go, we don't need to do this yet at all. We're, we gotta go fix the other stuff. We gotta, you know, we, we are not, what are we paying for, right? And the problem is this gets skipped, this planning and direction, because it is like, everybody wants just to go to market. 
right? So, and we see in the security community what happens when you go to market, WEP, and many other things, obviously. So this also is, has to succumb to that. So one of the things that uh, has been tightly done at Deloitte is, is uh, get, living these strict guidelines and say, you know, to, to go to market, we actually got to do this properly, right? So, um, and I would, I, I'll tell you, like this, this requirements, this planning is like the biggest thing, and it's usually the, big, the most ignored, right? So, um, you know, um, the collection process. Obviously, everybody, I think most companies out there do pretty much collection. When you see a threat feed, is collection processing and dissemination. You know, that's pretty much what they do. There's a lot of tools out there that'll do that for you. They'll get feeds, everything like this. So obviously a collection is you're obviously gathering information. Now, sometimes this is broken down in teams. This is broken down in some automated like services, you know, scripts, you know, code, platforms, everything, right? So, um, and then on the processing, you have to normalize this data. So everybody talks about this big data thing that we have a big unicorn at, the, at, at, uh, at work that says at the bottom of it, it says, I love it when you call me big data. Now it's a unicorn for a reason, right? It's a big mythical creature, right? So big data is actually a problem not a marketing word. It's not a, a, a thing you buy, it is a problem, right? And so when we talk about big data, the problem that they have is like, I don't see anybody with a big data problem just yet. I see a people that don't know how to handle their data and that seems to be the problem, is they don't understand the difference between the data they should be looking at and the data that they're wasting time with, right? So, so they throw everything in there and say, we have a big data problem. This is why we always get ahead of ourselves and find ourselves still like stumbling over our shoes, right? Like or, or, or our, you know, uh, uh, shoestrings, basically. So um, in this, basically, when you normalize that data, one of the things that, you know, is really important in processing that data is you'll learn what you don't need, you know, very quickly, right? So that, that's a very big process. And this needs to be very much paid attention before you even get to analysis, right? So but analysis is the difference between information and intelligence, period. Right? If you got a threat feed, all I have is that's, that's information, right? What am I going to do with that? But, but without analysis, I can even give you a do dossier of a profile of a, of a person. And to me, that's pretty much just information. Now I got to combine that with other information and start doing analysis and, and like actually building a story, right? Uh, you got to construct a meaningful picture, right? You know, it's, it's context. Right, and, it, and it, this context has to make, uh, allow people to make clear decisions, right? Because that's what intelligence is really about. It's the decisions you need to be making, you know, have, right? And then we have dissemination, right? And that's been a complicated one. We, uh, anybody heard of the traffic light protocol? Not a single person, right? Okay, okay good, thank God. Okay, <laughs> oh yeah, and the team back there, yeah. Stop bragging, no. Um, okay, good. A lot of people though, I'm, I'm finding out, don't know what the traffic light protocol is. Now, so, some of you have ever worked in uh, DOD or high side of work, anybody? Just you don't have to necessarily raise your hand if you don't want to. But and some of you understand classifications or clearances, I assume, right? So, so under that, you know, when you get to below CUI, which is you know, basically uh, confidential and classified information, we get this. There is the thing called uh, traffic light protocol. And it seems to confuse a lot of people, but basically it's still something. It's how you deal with sensitive information when you're sharing it in this uh, Intel community. So the dissemination, right? We're talking here on the news all day about information sharing is the way to s solve this problem, right? So the problem is, is the, the complications of just who you're going to share it with and why, and who's going to share it now. How's the government going to share it with you and why? Well, what if their IOCs are classified and why, right? Oh, well, we can't do anything. Even if we can get over there with our clearances, we're gonna stay in a skiff, we're gonna watch it and go, oh, that's cool, I can't use it on my network to fix anything because it's classified, right? So, so when we get back into these problems with the sharing itself and the dissemination, you know, for instance, I get questions, we have, a, of course, a CTI feed or whatever, and people are like, hey, did you put the newest, latest, you know, attack IOCs in the feed? And I'm like, no, it's, and they're like, why? I said, because it can't go to everybody. Right, it's TLP Amber, which is, okay, so you have red basically is, if I tell this room this is TLP Red conference, or this talk is TLP Red, everybody in this room keeps basically, that's all that it's, it's disseminated to. You can't talk about it any other way. We don't talk about Fight Club. TLP Amber is lowered down to industry and organization need to know. If, I, if it's marked TLP Amber, you can share this within your industry or organization or the people that are on this list that need to know or the rest of your team. But you know, basically keep in mind that with this is not a public document and we don't want everybody having it. And it's only really specific to if they need to have it, right? Then we have TLP Green, which is still not public. TLP Green says you, know, you can spend it pretty wide open to most of your industry in general, right? Um, but don't make it a public document, 
right? And then you have TLP white, which is this, you know, the document is completely public, right? So this is a classification under the actual existing classification for the Intel community for in the world of cyber. This gets really interesting. So when you deal with dissemination, I know I'm spending a lot of time, but dissemination has to be really thought out about because now we're going to be go doing beyond dissemination. We're going to be sharing information. And that's like that, that mastery alone is pretty interesting. Like imagine you, uh, you uh, mark something like you send a PDF to a group that's uh, sharing information and you say, check this out. They don't know whether to throw it in their malware lab or read the document, right? So that, that's another problem too, right? So these things are uh, uh, still being developed, right? And then obviously to fix this problem is feedback. One of the best things actually, and I'll tell you how like, you know, when people ask about uh, uh, how are you doing it, you know, Lance, how, how, what is exactly that you're doing and why do the clients like it? It's because they're getting a bi-directional relationship. They're going to share with me too. And they're getting feedback. And if we, if we don't do well with it, and we do like a weekly feedback meeting, that, you know, we figure out how to improve our process. This is a, this is a cycle. So you know, things like that. So th this is in, you know, intelligence. And the difference is all you have to do with cyber apply to it is basically cy cyber space being a domain, just like land, sea, air, merit, uh, like, uh, uh, space. Cyber is a domain basically, that you apply this process to. So now we have just defined cyber intelligence, technically. So, um, you know, and then internally in that, we also get into cyber counterintelligence, which can get fun. Um, this one is what we mainly do, and I think a lot of other people that were in this business mainly do, and they don't call it the right thing. They, they call it threat research or this or that. Um, but basically, it's the efforts made by security teams to prevent hostile or criminal or adversarial organizations from successfully gathering and collecting intelligence against them. So far, we failed with all these breaches, right? So, um, <laughs> you know, uh, so the interesting thing is defining the word actionable, right? Actionable is found in deeply analyzing observable details left by attackers, TTPs. Now, TTPs, techniques, techniques, and procedures, for any of you who don't know, um, are the biggest, uh, you know, telltale. So when we look at IR, uh, you know, IR data, like, you know, someone's got breached, it's the TTPs that get clustered together and say, okay, that looks like this actor and this actor or this actor. Are these tools used by these people? Um, traditional defense counterintelligence, defensive counterintelligence, uh, focused on human intelligence and spies. Uh, was developed mostly like uh, using uh, during World War II with like OSI and like obviously uh, different uh, British intelligence, all these different players, and has continued to evolve. Applying it to cyber, basically. Um, you know, we look at the different types of things. We have human here. Human in cyberspace is very important. It's interesting, though, because it's different. It's not the same. I can't see you online. I can't see your body language. I have to, to relate trust in a different way. I have to infer things. Language. Now we have things like natural language processing. I have to take neuro-linguistic concepts, like your language you use, and apply them to, is this, uh, you know, useful? Basically, I'm kind of coming in blind, right? But there are ways to do it. You know, um, but there's a lot of inference and, you know, people are building modeling systems and things like that to solve this problem. But it's all about in, in the deception angle, it's about misplaced trust. Can you get this person to trust you? And in the human world, even in over the computer, the trick is codependency, right? You get them to be codependents of, of you, you, they will be hanging on and trusting you. So um, SIGINT, basically, this is uh, similar. So when we deal with SIGINT, this is going to still continue. Radio OPSEC, use of secure telephones. Basically, OPSEC, by the way, and information security, uh, us information security practitioners are, are, we really are lacking on our own OPSEC. We have like totally, I find it all the time. I'm surprised my wallet's not out of my pocket and sitting here. But basically, you know, we're good at protecting everybody else's networks, but we tend to forget to look at ourselves, right? Um, and so that's kind of an interesting thing, especially with all the swatting. And so a lot of your information security jobs are moving into intelligence or chasing bad guys. That is becoming the primary thing. And this process, this OPSEC process has to like start you know, coming into play. You saw Brian Krebs getting swatted, right? And it's kind of like one of those things, or Krebs is a personal friend, but I told him, it's like, live by the sword, die by the sword, right? You, you, gotta, you gotta know what you're, you're doing out there. You're, you're upsetting some people, you might wanna, you know, take that as a, as a weighed risk, right? Um, comment, basically, um, comment, basically communication intelligence. This is countermeasures, psyops, deceptions, camouflages. Some of that's mostly done, um, you know, in the military, but it also can be applied here online, right? So, for instance, you know, you can, you know, send false information. We see it all the time with Anonymous about the fake, uh, you know, database dumps. That's common, basically. They're basically messing with our heads. We, we don't know and we're wasting time and it makes us actually have to do a lot more than we uh, need to in a day. Um, so, basically, to get even there where you're doing, countering espionage or any of this stuff, you need to fix the basics. We all know that everybody here is all for that. I get that, right? So, 
Um, but we basically fix these basics via the threat modeling and a lot of those things. But a lot of this comes down to the people stuff. We've obviously dealt with politics uh, in places now. It's kind of the thing I realized this morning. In theory, you could do anything in an enterprise. In practice, you could hardly get anything done. Right, so that's kind of the reality of like, you know, you say, oh, we're going to change you and you guys, we're going to move you over to a portal and you're going to put all your SIM stuff in there. I'm like, ha, ha, yeah, no, nah. you, you know, this is an enterprise, right? Right, so that's, that's how it works, right? So, so we got to kind of like either build a model that actually deals with those problems and is aware like, look, things are, some things are never going to change. How do we assume and work in an environment that still has to address that and know that we're on a hostile, you know, internet basically, right? So. Um, Self-awareness um, first, right? You know, know your network. You know, everybody talks about intelligence and all the intelligence they should be getting. There's nothing more valuable in intelligence than your own network. Do you know what your DNS is doing? Do you know how many dynamic DNSs went out today and like connected to your thing? Do you know any of the new DNS cache? Do you know how old every DNS connection you're actually having? Why is there a 30, less than 30 day old DNS uh, query coming out of my network? Do you know why it's NXDing all over the place, right? Like, you know, categorize your information, right? You know, a lot of people like, are like so respond, uh, like, you know, just kind of responding right now. And it should be more like, you know, go back and say, let's set a project for the next three months. We're going to learn what our DNS is doing. And then we're going to do another thing for three months. And we're going to do it. Iteratively, you will fix these problems, you know. So, um, but basically also situational awareness. Know yourself and control your enemy, you know, and understand how you are perceived, right? So if you look weak, you will be perceived as weak, right? So... I'm going to skip this because I have really five uh, minutes, um, but you know, I'm going to hand out these slides so you guys can uh, play with them. But basically, this is adversarial way, and it's, this is the threat uh, model kill chain. This is actually how, uh, you know, when you look at like IR, where you would stop and look at each spot and to learn your, uh, what TTPs are. Um, the attack strategy is similar, recon, infiltrate, command and control, theft, install. You know, this is all the technical stuff, and I'm skipping it. I'm such a bastard, right? So basically, it focuses on getting persistent, right, and staying in there, right? Um, so I kind of already said this, but basically, um, you know, uh, knowing your network is like, as much as I want to talk cyber intelligence, the reality is the cyber intelligence is what's, you know, it's your network intelligence. It's, it's what you guys are already doing, you know, and you got to drive that. You got to be responsible. And I call it advanced persistent marketing because I feel in the information security, we have to be responsible and not let companies get that far ahead and like start touting stuff we don't believe in. We invented this industry, like basically 15, 20 years ago, we were the ones trying to wait for the mic to come on. And now the mic's here. And we don't want to let the marketing teams exploit that too much. We have the right to like basically stick with our principles and fix this stuff, you know? And that's kind of the moral of this talk really is that don't let the buzzword, the cyber intelligence not be it. So my job at Deloitte is to bring the real thing here, right? Like when I'm not going to sit there, you can fire me otherwise and say, you know, if, if you're not going to do it the marketing way, I'm not going to do it the marketing way. It will market itself. You'll make money. Everybody will do it. But if you ask me to defend this network or our customers' networks, I'm not going to lie to them, right? So the same thing goes with that. We got to like, you know, kind of like take that position. We own this industry. We started it, right? So like, don't forget that, right? You know, so uh, we all got to make a buck, get that. But like, you know, also like, remember our principles, our job is to protect people as practitioners, right? We, we're trying to protect our networks. We're trying to protect the systems and you know, okay, fine. You can make money because it takes time and everything like that. But like, make sure that that is the number one uh, principle. So, um, Another thing before I go, though, this is actually a big thing. It's like, okay, we talked about indicators of compromise. Everybody has been hearing that, right? IPs, hashes. It's not observable indicators, okay? Those are IPs and hashes. They don't solve a problem for me, really. What is an indicator for me? What indicates what? What, what does it do? It? I want to know motivation. I want to know objectives, timeliness. This is what I want to see in taxi sticks, right? This is the, the data I want to actually make as a model around resources, risk tolerance, skills and method, actions, attack origination points. Numbers involved in attack and the, you know, the knowledge source, where are they actually getting their information, right? This is the data, this is attribution, this is what will solve a lot of our problems. This is knowing your enemy, not, I've got a bunch of things that can run on my proxy, blah, 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 we've blocked. They're gonna keep attacking until you understand and solve this problem, right? So um, if you do build a, a threat intelligence team or whatever, you gotta realize that there's behavioral analysis involved. It's a very diverse thing and it can be expensive. So you gotta figure out what you're solving, right? But, you know, is your company have the, uh, the skills and stuff? Are, are they even worried about that? Um, are they worried about threat actor and attribution and neutralization? People are like, oh, well, why, why are you doing attribution? Because you want to keep them out of your network? I can show you what their network looks like so you know that they can't get in again, right? That, that's exactly it, you know? So, um, you know, so I'm going to skip through this stuff. But basically, you know, uh, the biggest questions and now it's very pertinent is, you know, sh adversary interaction, should we leave it, you know, to the government? With this new inner... In, uh, 
uh, cyber intelligence agency, what, what roles are we going to take as, uh, as uh, you know, uh, commerce versus government? It's going to be an interesting time. You know, where's the line in when we want to protect our networks? Should we get to know our adversary that well, right? Um, you know, um, and then there's a lot of skills required, such as psychology and some law, because obviously you can't just talk to people and entrap them all day. Just because you're not an FBI agent doesn't mean you can't act like you're not, you know, don't know the law. So, um, but basically, uh, basic information security achieved basically through, if we start solving one, like I said, one at a time, you know, we can save ourselves a lot of trouble. Don't start running into threat intelligence or running into cyber intelligence without starting to, to make a plan and direction to solve these earlier problems. Um, Security serves the business, invest in the right people, set the expectations for investing in technology basically, but what problems are you solving? Don't panic, stop reading the news. I will tell you that now, just stop reading the news. Okay, <laughs> I have not seen so many people panic. Shell shock, oh my God, this, that, oh my God. I was like, ugh. What happened to ethical disclosure? What how about getting it passed before you write up your article? Right, so uh, stay strategic. Um, these guys are no more advanced than, than, uh, than your enterprise anyway. So you guys run advanced technologies. Everybody's been in this industry 15, 20 years. This is new to them, kind of, right? You know, we actually could kick their butts if we, if we, knew, you know, if we took this seriously. We really could. Our skill sets, their, their skill set is this. And we're, you know, so, I mean, collaboratively, we can do this, right? Um, you know, but basically, just be as much as persistent as they are getting in, be as, as, as getting out. So any questions? Sorry for the rant. <sighs> Yeah. Light them up, boys. Using your um, football, Magic analogy, skills. Yeah. football analogy, as a, which is brilliant, the deep, cause I'm, I love the defensive side of football. Do you find that perception management can be relegated to the way, uh, the way defenses change the structure in response to an um, offense, if you will? Mm -hmm. We can change the per perception based on what we perceive. We understand the threat to be rather than what the marketing team seems to think it is, Correct. and then react accordingly rather right. take a proactive measure than react. Very much. That's actually the way to do it, right? So, I mean, you can use marketing to also control your perception or deliver the message you want for perception, but in the reality is, you know, it's got to come down to self-awareness. Who the heck are you, right? Do you know yourself well enough? Like, everything that comes out of my mouth, do I know how it's coming across? Do I, am I aware of that? Most people don't, like on a personal level, right? It takes years of experience. But, you know, collectively, brand is, is a big thing. You know, for instance, if you're a retailer and you got breached and this and that, you want to set a brand that says, don't mess with us, this and that. You got to be careful about those outcomes too. Is that going to make someone get, feel challenged and go and attack it again and make a point? Or have you also set up that, that perception? Like, for instance, the NSA has a great perception. No one really messes with them, really. I mean, except for Snowden, but that's a long story. But basically, like, you know, you know just kind of like no one robs banks if they have the right perception, right? So same thing here. It's like, you know, the CIA has its own perception. The NSA has its own perception. And they're very much clear on why they have that perception. The same with what you, you, you do as a business, you know. Uh, uh, there are banks out there that literally have a perception that they made it very clear that security is their number one concern, right? And so that, that's, that's I, it'll definitely play a big part, yes. What I've found interesting the last few years, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. Um, even, even banks and, and just companies in general that have said security is their number one concern is they would get pen tests and get assessments. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> Those would become just rubber stamps, right? Those would get completely, right. uh, completely abolished. Bad guys are pen tests. You'll see the and difference. So, you want to see we, if someone gets in, use a bad guy. Uh, and so <laughs> right. the better, the better pen testers, the better security personnel that could really rip through a network. Right. Um, they weren't allowed to do that. They haven't right. allowed to do that. Are we seeing a time where it's finally going to change? War gaming is kind of starting to come its thing, but I'm still kind of like. You know, I gotta, I, I'll tell you, we, we're, for instance, getting into war gaming on our side of Deloitte, but uh, also in general, uh, I'm seeing people in startups coming out with some really nifty stuff, right? Uh, and it's attack simulation, right? And, and it'll give you more of a view of this. Now, like I said, you know, you, you want to pin against pen tester versus a bad guy, you know, the bad guy's going to get in. The pen testers didn't prove anything because your report was good. You, you are compliant. Like, you played that. But the, again, it's like those contests. You know, if someone asks me, oh, here's a hacking contest, I'll give you a million dollars if you get to get in, but here's all these rules. I'm going to break into the ISP prior to that and actually sniff everything on the wire. That's how I'm getting in. But unfortunately, that's illegal, right? You can't play that game. Well, the people that are attacking you don't care. 
right? So, you know, so, so there's an interesting thing. I think we've been dealing with like uh, waivers that are called hold, hold harmless, right? And those are actually allowing us to DDoS ourselves or certain people so that we can actually like do some of this stuff. A lot of it's going to be interesting, but Wargaming kind of seems to be where it's going because it's about business continuity, but I hope to see more of the, you know, take the pen, pen attack teams and put them in that picture as well and like build out like a strategy of IR teams, almost like capture the flag. Right, because capture the flag is pretty darn realistic in that sense. It's a lot more realistic than everything else is. So, yeah. What about doing everything you're talking about and getting insight into the posture of our, our third parties and our vendors who have our data in their hands? Well, that's funny, right? So we talk about cloud, right? We talk about cloud security. And we're like, oh my God, cloud. We're gonna put it on the cloud and all this stuff. What's your policy for cloud? Well, it should be the same for your partners, right? Right? They are a cloud to you. They are out. They are external communication. It should be an external threat concern. You should be doing external threat assessments. You know, trust is relative, and on the online, it, it's 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 not really a, something you can validate. It's uh, right now, right? So you need to treat everything like that as a security policy. What is my policy with dealing with external information coming in or out? No matter how, oh, we've got a VPN and this and that. Well, if you're dealing with the cloud, everybody's making a big fuss and making a big ordeal and like, oh, it's insecure, but you're not treating the same way with your third parties that you've already like assigned in. They've got more access to the cloud will ever take from you. You know, the cloud, you put out what you want, right? In this case, some of these people like, I mean, most of your third parties are broken in. That's how these APTs are getting in. Something in Venezuela got into this or that and it's some partner. Right, you know, so you need to basically go back, review your security policy on the same way you would treat cloud, and say, okay, let's review our posture on third parties, right? And we hold each other responsible, accountable. How do you stop like basically bad things from happening or people doing bad things? Accountability. People, uh, those third parties are stakeholders too, right? You know, so that's the best answer I could get. But it's mostly a business decision, you know. So in that sense, so thank you very much. So. <clears throat>